Hello and welcome to my series of conversations with men and women as ideas, vision and philosophy define our contemporary world. The program today is privileged to have a Nobel laureate for chemistry in 1988, Dr. Helmut Michael. Welcome. Uh, you got the Nobel Prize for your work on uh, the crystallization of membranes uh, and, and um, the, the study of the crystalline um, substance that was produced through the process. Uh, I have to confess I need a 101 in, in American jargon uh, on, on, on what this research was. It's not so easy to explain, but I will try my best. <laughs> Let me start off, we try to make crystals. And you know, crystals are pleasant substances. Diamonds are crystals and so on. All these jewelry stones are crystals. And we like to make crystals of small proteins. And in our opinion, they are much more valuable than diamonds are <laughs> because we can get a deep knowledge on to how nature works. And uh, what we got the Nobel Prize for is uh, the isolation and the crystallization of the heart of photosynthesis. And I just want to remind you that uh, the photosynthesis is the most important process on Earth because all energy which we get, which we get on Earth, if we don't count nuclear energy, comes from the sun. And the process is for the synthesis and uh, that is a process where we harvest the light of the sun and then the collected energy is uh, focused onto a so-called center for the synthesis, reaction center for the synthesis. And I managed to isolate that from a bacterium which does for the synthesis and to get crystals out of it. This was to be considered to be impossible at the time. So uh, getting these nice crystals, these crystals also look very nice, they have a very nice color. <laughs> it's a pleasure to work with this kind of proteins and to study them. These were sort of biological, working with biological membranes. Yes. And, and what is the, the, the significance uh, of, of, of this in, in terms of its application? At that time in photosynthesis, uh, people think that you can improve uh, photosynthesis. This is not true with respect to the very primary reaction because photosynthesis is somehow also a dangerous process because the combination of light and especially when oxygen is involved is dangerous. And uh, nature in the plant has con continuously to repair the, uh, these photosynthetic centers. Yeah? And these repair processes are very difficult to mimic uh, if you would, you would develop an artificial device for harvesting. Also, the energy uh, yield is uh, not so high as it is generally believed. So, and a, a potential application of this uh, has been uh, to the development of uh, new drugs that could target malignancies, for example. Uh, not at that photosynthetic work. Mm -hmm. the, the, the work we do now is toward it, toward, directed towards it. The earlier work with respect to application could be used to uh, develop herbicides. Yeah? Mm -hmm. against weeds in the fields of farmers. Mm -hmm. So we had some contact with, uh, with, with the industry uh, trying to develop them. They'd like to get our new knowledge in order to, uh, to get improved herbicides. Mm -hmm. But now we turned gears and we went towards uh, proteins from the human body. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just would, would, would like to say that you and your body, you have about 10,000 different membrane proteins. Mm -hmm. yeah? And uh, there are about 850 receptors of a certain class which, which are of primary interest for, uh, uh, for medicine. Mm -hmm. These are the same class of receptors which use, for instance, light energy. Mm -hmm. yeah? And they, you get the light signal. Also, the same class of receptors are those which, uh, which uh, are excited by the smell molecules, mm -hmm. so-called olfactory receptors. Mm -hmm. And it's a coincidence that this year's Nobel Prize in medicine or physiology has been awarded to Richard Axel and, uh, and, 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 to, and, to, and, and to Linda and, uh, for that kind of work. Mm -hmm. And because they, they deceived how these smell, re uh, smell receptors work and how this is converted into a smell signal in the brain. Mm -hmm. We are more oriented towards understanding these kind of molecules on their precise mechanism. If we know the precise mechanism, we would be able to develop drugs against many, many diseases. Mm -hmm. How does this sort of uh, locate itself in, in, in the discourse and, and, and the sort of the sense of achievement with the Human Gen Genome Project? The Human Genome Project provides us with new targets. Uh, it became clear that uh, the so-called rhodopsin-like or G-protein coupled receptors that are about 850 different molecules in the human body. 
uh, about uh, close to 200 were already known and uh, 150 more at that time were speculated to exist but now we know there are about 850. The precise uh, number is still uncertain and this tells you that even if you know the genome you do not know everything. You have to, you, to knowing the genome is just the start to work. But now we have a basis for a solid work. First thing is if we have a genome we have to ID the, identify the genes. Mm -hmm. This is still in progress and even in yeast, Baker's yeast, the number of genes goes up and up despite the fact that the genome was sequenced already five or six years ago. Mm -hmm. So even with genome we don't know anything, we don't know so much. Mm -hmm. We still have to work. Working so uh, intimately and in, 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 in closely into the sort of the microscopic universe in a sense, uh, what does it do to a scientist in, in, in terms of his you know, macro vision? Um, you know, I, Einstein frequently felt that you know when he looked at the order in, 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 in science it reminded him of God and he felt that it was only possible if there was a larger vision or force or something oh, that was guiding right. it. Oh, so with this yeah. kind of detailing that you, that, 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 uh, yeah. that, that you go into and explore, what does it tell you about the universe? Oh, what does it tell us about the universe? I would still think the most important thing is the human brain. Yeah? If we understand the human brain, we may be able to understand what, how much human beings can understand. Yeah? I think it's not the physics which should dominate our, 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 uh, our thinking. It's our own brain which dominates our thinking. So we have to understand our own brain. And still the question is open if a machinery can understand itself. Mm -hmm. yeah? mm -hmm. It has to be answered. There's also a discussion going on about, uh, from, uh, uh, from science whether still going on, at least in Germany, whether we have a free will at all. Mm -hmm. yeah? The concept of a free will mm -hmm. is going on. What, are your, own, going on. what are your own intuitions sort of when, you, when, you, when you go into that kind of uh, a, a detail, which is really sort of beyond uh, our, our conventional notions of you know, human vision, what the eye can see, or transcending what the eye can see, or going into something much more subtle. Uh, uh, what are those sort of subtle processes tell you? In terms of your own experience, your own hunches, your own intuition, my own, in, my, my own intu intu intuition, I, I still we, we, we come from that, from understanding the brain, we, c we come close to philosophy. Mm -hmm. yeah? And many, many of the thoughts which we have are, are still already present in the, uh, in, in, with the old Greek philosophers. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually what we, for instance, we don't know whether you are just in imagination, whether you really exist. I cannot tell you. I do not know of any experiment to find out whether you exist or whether you are just imagination in my brain. Mm -hmm. yeah? mm -hmm. And this is questions which we can consider me and, and we have to ask and uh, mm -hmm. but I clearly I believe that you exist and you are not just in imagination in my brain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, does this the feeling of, uh, of, of, of certitude that science offers uh, or, or science in a sense uh, demands you know sort of working with, with the empirical and you're talking here about the imagination whether this is yeah. real whether I exist yeah. or not. Yeah. Um, how do you how do you reconcile these two sort of responses that you have? Oh, actually, I'm a much more practical person, be, being with, uh, on Earth with both feet. Yeah? <laughs> so uh, I normally uh, stay pretty close to the experimental facts and what we, what we do experimentally. And uh, I'm rather, I don't like to promise too much in, from, from, our, from our work. I try, uh, I try to be very cautious. For me, uh, research is curiosity driven. It is like scientists are like little children. A, a, a little boy or a little girl tries to find out how something looks like, how it works out. If you give it, give it something, a play takes pieces apart and tries to put it together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we scientists are still like little children, mm -hmm. so we're privileged. Mm -hmm. We can, as adults, mm -hmm. behave as little children, take mm -hmm. things apart, mm -hmm. look, have a look how they work and put the things together again. Mm -hmm. yeah? And we create knowledge. And we are very, very happy if this knowledge which we create helps mankind to improve conditions of living. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, without uh, the improvements in science, we would not have been able to improve agriculture. Mm -hmm. The food supply that no longer, uh, that India is self-sufficient in uh, food supply mm -hmm. is also a result of scientific research. We'll come to that in a moment. You're watching a conversation with Dr. Helmut Michael, Nobel Laureate, 1988 for Chemistry. We'll be right back after a short break. Don't go away. Welcome back to a continuing conversation with the Nobel Laureate for Chemistry, 1988, Dr. Helmut Michael. Uh, you were talking about the applications 
uh, of uh, your research and, on, in, in, and its applications in pesticides and how that is transforming uh, or helping transform agriculture uh, in India. Um, give us a sense of, of, of the steps involved uh, in, in, in that process, you know, how your research gets translated into this application. <laughs> Our own research goes to the development of herbicides and fungicides. I mentioned already that our work on photosynthetic centers can help to improve the development of herbicides. And there's a need for new herbicides which are less stable, which are biodegradable and don't, uh, are not enriched in the environment. So safer herbicides is clearly a demand which, uh, where we can help. The second point is uh, where our present work contributes is the development of fungicides. And actually we make uh, use of uh, discovery of German scientists where it was found, found out that on pine cones in German forests there is just one mushroom growing. And this mushroom, a fungus, actually synthesizes a compound which kills off bacteria and kills other fung fungi. So, and uh, German scientists tried to find out why this is. It turned out that uh, these uh, mushrooms do kind of chemical warfare. They synthesize a compound, which, uh, synthesize a compound, and this compound actually acts on the membrane proteins, which we also study. So we now have investigated how these compounds interact with our membrane protein complexes. In this case, it's a membrane protein complex of respiration. Also, respiration, the consumption of oxygen. You take in your oxygen; it's distributed in the body, and there it's burned in the so-called respiratory chain. And these complexes are, uh, are also of great importance. And uh, fungi have it also, and they depend on it. And when we block these complexes, we, we kill the fungi. And this uh, knowledge is now used to improve and to speed up the development of new fungicides. Actually, in Germany, uh, w the yield in wheat goes up by 50% when you use these fungicides. But so you know, there is a popular uh, you know, perception of fear of sort of chemicals entering the food chain. Uh, and there's a great deal of controversy. The European Union has sort of been thinking about uh, you know, the, the applications, particularly of genetically modified uh, uh, crops. Uh, yeah, yeah. Where as a scientist do you stand? Do you have sort of the infinite faith that you know, the, the, the scientific uh, interventions will ultimately be safe and reliable? I, I strongly believe in that. Uh, from the very beginning, we have to I, we have to discriminate between genetically modified organism, GMO food, and we have to uh, discriminate between the chemicals which we use in agriculture. And uh, in my opinion, uh, it is quite clear that uh, the fungicides, insecticides, help to, uh, to, to get a high yield. Farmers here ha ha have many, many profits of, of from that. And, uh, uh, but for some of the insecticides are dangerous, highly dangerous. Uh, and uh, people are very much aware of the, po have a look whether uh, the, the food still contains uh, remnants of, uh, of, of the fungicides or herbicides or insecticides. And I should say normally these remnants are checked whether they are, uh, whether they are, uh, they are detrimental to our health. And uh, on the other hand, if you don't do that, you clearly have also the danger that uh, especially fungi produce many often toxic compounds, for instance, aflatoxins. And uh, even in, in, if in, in now there are, in, at least in Germany, cases where people use all this organic food and they, are, and they get quite often they get poisoning, they get poisoning from, these, uh, from these compounds from, from fungal infections. And, uh, but actually, uh, use of fungicide means that this danger is reduced. So even with chemical fungicides, there's a clear chance of improvement. One has to be very careful. One should not, one should, well, of course, one, one, uh, one should reduce these compounds as far as possible. The, the other thing is uh, genetically engineered organisms. And actually, India is a country which makes use of it, in contrast to Germany. And I, uh, one example which I learned in India is that the use of genetically modified cotton saves about 500 lives per year in India already. Mainly due to the fact that uh, you have to use insecticides. And insecticides, as I already mentioned, are normally dangerous. And these in insecticides 
the misuse or wrong use, not correct use of these insecticides leads to the killing of about 500 farmers per year in India. And with the use of these genetically, genetically modified organisms, uh, they are in resistant, the cotton plant is resistant against these insects. So they don't have to use the insecticide anymore. And this saves in India 500 lives per year. So it's only a very convincing example. Uh, about the use of genetically modified organisms here in India. This has, has, has particular sort of implications uh, with the pharmaceutical industry and this, uh, you know, the, the drug that was being uh, pushed and, and promoted and, and, and hard sold for arthritis. Is, you know, suddenly medical science says now, you know, hold on, this isn't quite safe and that's happened quite quickly. So t to what degree it, you know, the, do the scientists who develop these things have a sense of larger responsibility. We have to think about the consequences of our research, uh, research uh, quite early. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, you as a scientist, you are, you are a specialist. Yeah? And uh, we had a discussion very recently about all these consequences uh, about our work and how much we can actually talk to the public. The point is, if you are really a specialist, you have to work hard. And to be successful, you have to be concentrated and focused. On the other hand, talking to the public is a difficult story. You and mean this has been a difficult experience for you here? Oh, here, it's, here it's, 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 it's really a pleasure to talk to you. I have to, I clearly have to say, yeah. So it's, 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 yeah. I like to say, let me correct it. Yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah. And, uh, but they, uh, having convincing arguments in the public, and uh, you know that quite often these um, activists of organization against genetically modified organisms, they are professionals. And normally scientists are not prepared because they, in their head, Science dominates, not uh, not to say to turn the public opinion and to do uh, advertisements. No, There's different kind. This is always the dilemma which we have. But you know that that at, in, inevitably you talked about how scientists are like children and you have curiosity and you want to fulfil that. But it's also uh, you know a lot of economics investments in research, raising resources. Uh, Political imperatives, uh, you know, the United States government will say, well, you know, hold on on cloning or someone else will say, hold on on stem cell research, do this and don't do that. So it isn't really, uh, you know, sort of pure childlike curiosity. Right, if, if it comes to application, we have to, be, have to be very careful. And I completely agree that we should not do cloning of human beings eh? for reproductive cloning, for creating new people. Eh? It's really dangerous and we should not do that. Eh? That what can be debated is uh, the so-called therapeutic cloning, but I don't think there is really a need for that. But, but do you think it's in fact going to be possible to restrain that kind of research? Uh, there, th there should be a, a first a common consensus of the scientists, but I doubt that it will be achieved because there are organizations in South Korea or people in Italy who strongly advocate human cloning, and they, sometimes they claim that they have done it, which, which are false claims. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it might be also become a big business if, if, uh, if, if somebody likes to reproduce him or herself. Mm -hmm. uh, they may pay lots of money, and it's a danger we have really to, our moral behavior should be really, uh, should, should, should be okay in that respect. We should really uh, reject this kind of things. So, you know, for an em 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 empirical scientist such as yourself, what then becomes a moral framework? So there is a moral framework, uh, you know, to science. It's not just sort of an amoral pursuit of knowledge. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> it's even further. We, we, we have ethics com committees in Germany discussing all these issues. Yeah? Uh -huh. uh, but I'm not, I'm not, a, not a, say, a front person of, the, of these discussions. I, as I said, I, I'm more towards the applied, immediately applied, site and develop new drugs to help people is clearly a safe thing. I clearly would not like to go into, into uh, embryonic stem cell research. You're watching a conversation with the Nobel laureate for chemistry in 1988. We'll be right back after a short break. Don't go away. Welcome back to a continuing conversation with Dr. Mikhail. Uh, what brings you to India. You were telling me before this program that you've been to India several times, starting as a, as a backpacker. Uh, but what brings you here as Nobel laureate? Here for the moment, uh, there are at least three reasons why I'm here. First, uh, when the German Chancellor uh, visited India about two months ago, uh, there was a new start off of uh, a so called uh, Indo German Science Circle. And, uh, and I had the pleasure to give the first lecture there. 
This was one reason. The second reason is also on the same occasion there was a memorandum of understanding undersigned between the president of the Max Planck Society. I'm a member of the Max Planck Society, director of a Max Planck Institute with Indian Research Institution, with the, secret with the state secretary here, about improved collaboration. And we try to bring back Indians, Indian students who had a chance to work in Germany at our institutions for, uh, for several years, to bring them back to India and give them and provide them with startup money. This is, was the second reason. The third reason is uh, a number of Indian institutes, especially the Indian Institutes of Technology, uh, were in very interested to have me there for a conversation and to start about potential collaborations. So what is your sort of you know, response uh, to, to, to looking at in the state of Indian science, Indian scientific uh, institutions, and what do you think are the, the inhibitors uh, to, to scientific, uh, major scientific breakthroughs in India? Is oh, there a mindset? Is there I, a I don't think it's a mindset. If we, can, we, can, we, can back to, we can go back in Indian history. And uh, Bangalore used to be a great place for science. And uh, you, had, you have, which is very rare for a developing country, you have, a, you, you have a Nobel Prize winner who got the work for work done in India. And another scientist, uh, also from southern India, he was pretty close and, uh, to a Nobel Prize. And so what are the qualities? Uh, of a good scientist, apart from this sense of curiosity that you oh, spoke uh, about, without you, you have to have a motivation, and you have to uh, you, uh, you have to have a, a good training, and you have to have a good background uh, for, uh, for, for to do that. And uh, it a uh, little bit a problem when you really do have to do experiments, and you need you need a broad infrastructure, and to get this kind of infrastructure is not so easy. And for that, you also need lots of money, and uh, it's quite clear that uh, the United States are the dominant country. But if you look into their research budget, it's quite clear why they are the dominant country. Uh, the United States also, they try to hire the best people worldwide, give them a high salary, and give them freedom to operate their own research. So what gets you in Germany? <laughs> what kept me in Germany? I, could, I should say I had offers from about 20, 20 top places in, in, uh, in the US, in, including Harvard, uh, Harvard Medical School. But I decided to stay in Germany, but this was mainly due to the fact that uh, for me in Germany, it's much easier to do long-term risky projects because we have a good basic supply of money which is guaranteed. So I can tackle difficult problems, which is difficult to do in the United States. The United States changed a little bit uh, because uh, you may have, heard about, uh, may have heard about Howard Hughes. He was somehow crazy, a billionaire, yeah, developing rockets and all, and make, making billions of, and he donated about 15 billion US dollars. And these 15 billion US dollars According to the tax law, when you do a foundation on this foundation, has to spend 5% of the money each year for research. And with that, they give uh, selected scientists in the US uh, considerable amounts of money constantly, constantly for longer term. So now the situation has become also better to, uh, with respect to long term research. If you look back, they really, the, base, the big breakthroughs in science quite often come from Europe, more often from Europe than the United States, because American science is too short-sighted and too competitive. And too sort of applied sciences in the sense that that's going to get them financial. It's, it's, also, it's also very much applied and <laughs> making money is, uh, is really also uh, driving power for scientists in the US is quite clear. It's more, more than in Europe. Yeah? I mean, in Europe we have more the absolute pure science and uh, scientists are quite often happy with simply being independent and, uh, and, and be able to do their work. So as someone, you know, you've got a Nobel Prize, you're, um, you know, very highly regarded and respected. What aspiration do you have for yourself now? What, what more? To continue in your research, of course, but uh, is there any other sort of pinnacle of, of appreciation that, that will make a difference for you? Did the Nobel Prize make a difference? Oh, the Nobel Prize makes a difference in your life, but I have to say I, I am not responsible for getting Nobel Prize. <laughs> I, I quite often feel more, feel more like a victim. Huh? So what, uh, way? what did it do to you? What, uh, you uh, it changes your life. You talk to different. You talk to different people, and you uh, you don't. I would even guess if I would not have got the Nobel Prize, I would be a more successful scientist, because I would have much more time to do science, to, to and to think about my own research projects. Uh, I now the effect that I, that I'm here is nice, very pleasant. <laughs> but uh, in you would rather be doing your laboratory I could, doing science. I could, I could think about experiments uh, also at the same time. Yeah? It's, but it's, it's also an unexpected stimul uh, stimulus here to, to, to be here, so it, it may help. Uh, but uh, now I'm, I'm 
in about 25 committees. Yeah? <laughs> and the only one committee takes me about six weeks per year. So it takes, without normal I would not be there. Yeah? Yeah? You talk to different society. Yeah? Class, you, you talk to government, you become an advisor for many, many parts. And the other, the other rather bad part is that if people have a problem, you end up to be some kind of an ombudsman. So if somebody fell to have been mistreated by rejection of a grant application or by not finding a job, uh, and they need, other, they need otherwise help, then they write to me and ask for help. Or I get, very often I get uh, requests for writing letters of recommendations, things like this. Yeah? And this doesn't make me to feel me happy if, uh, if you always uh, you, you should help people, you, people come to you with their problems and, and ask you to help. Yeah? So Nobel Prize changes your life and uh, if you are, I was 40 when I got the prize, uh, it's more, say, more time consuming when you are, when you are young than when you are, when you are, uh, when you are older when you, when you get the prize. Dr. Mikhail, thank you very much for these insights into the perils of the Nobel Prize. This has been a great privilege okay. and a great honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.